comes on, and it's going to blow out your ears. Okay, I'm Buckner Hightower. Um, it's been my pleasure to be uh, Art Dula's friend and partner for 23 years, and this is the first time anyone has ever asked me to introduce him. I'm tempted to conduct a roast, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep it brief, uh, however long that may take. Um, this particular group has already gone on record as to how they feel about Art Dula, having uh, given him uh, your uh, Pioneer of New Space Award three years ago. So Art's not a stranger to, to this crowd, but after 30 years in the field of space law and commercial space, uh, Art has become familiar to a lot of audiences. Uh, he's always available to give a talk. He is always available to inspire. Uh, Art has uh, taught space law at the University of Houston now for almost as long as his current students have been alive. Um, in his 30 years in space law, he has been uh, instrumental in the development of space law, which uh, uh, of course didn't exist uh, to the previous generation of lawyers, and he was once again, a pioneer of the development of space law. Um, Russia and the Soviet Union. Art has had uh, an interesting career in the Soviet Union and then Russia, one of the true groundbreakers. Uh, Art was one of the first Westerners to uh, obtain access to uh, Soviet space facilities. Um, he was the first American to see a launch at Baikonur Cosmodrome. That was big enough news in the U.S. that it was on the front page above the fold in the New York Times. Um, Art uh, has joint ventured with the Russians, uh, in fact was the founder of the first uh, American-Soviet joint venture in aerospace that uh, received uh, a lot of due attention at the time. Um, Art is a serial uh, entrepreneur. I'll tick them off, uh, and there are many others. Eagle Aerospace, Space Hab, Space Services Inc., the first private launch uh, of a rocket in the U.S., uh, Ad Astra Rocket Company, Excalibur Exploration, which is uh, involved in space mineral resources, uh, today's topic. Um, and to just list a few, Art is a member of the Board of Governors of the National Space Society, Fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, Associate Fellow of the IAA, Literary Executor of the Robert Heinlein uh, Trust and Trustee of the Heinlein Prize Trust, which Art discussed uh, in some detail of the previous panel. Renowned commercial space visionary, Art Dula. Have I got, have you got me, can you guys all hear me? Okay, there's, there's more people in this room than it took to start most of the major corporations that are worth like half of the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Index. I hope you all can do that because uh, you're the people I want to talk to. Uh, one time, I'm going to tell a few jokes first because you're always supposed to do that when you get up on stage. And, and besides which, I like telling, they're not really jokes, they're funny stories. I, I went into a Russian military factory one time that built the SS-18 Satan rocket, which is a, a, a the intercontinental missile that is aimed at, at whoever they aim it at. And, and I, they, they also built the first three space stations, and they built my company's uh, space stations and reusable reentry vehicles. They're really good. NPO Machina Terania in Ryotov, Moscow. Very secret, reports to the Department of Defense where their only commercial activity and they were just embargoed by the Obama administration. But I walked in there one time and I found old spaceships. So I said, old spaceship, is it any good? They said, we have a bunch of them. I said, can I sell one? They said, sure. I took it to New York, I sold it. It's in the Smithsonian. Nobody had ever seen one before. Guess what, it's reusable up to 15 times. Uh, another time I walked into this same shop and I saw this long torpedo looking thing that had Anybody here know what synthetic aperture radar is? You know, looks through clouds, looks through dark. And, and it was obviously a synthetic aperture radar, but I couldn't find the solar panel. So I asked my buddy, Mr. Blagoff, who's a genius, I said, Blagoff, where are the solar panels? And he walks up and he taps a thing about the size of an old Maytag washing machine, and he says, nuclear reactor. <laughs> and then, then his boss comes in and says, ah, Art, we should have put a tarpaulin over that. 
and he puts a tarpaulin over it. Another time they tried to sell me a fractional orbital bombardment system, you know, as a historical artifact. This goes over the South Pole and bombs San Antonio from, you know, because there's no radar looking south or wasn't back then. But these guys are our buddies now, unless you're a Ukrainian. Uh, okay, so, oh, lots of stuff. Like we had an alligator when we launched the first Conestoga rocket, the first American privately owned rocket to go into space. And, 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 and there was this alligator in the cooling pond because we were launching it from Toddy Lee Wynn's ranch in South Texas. And we're the only space program in the world that had to get alligator clearance because it was an endangered species. Uh, we would take jointed chicken pieces and distribute them liberally and the alligator would come out, we'd say, is Harvey out? Alligator clearance, launch. State Department tried to stop that by saying we had to have an export license to export the 200 pounds of sand into the Gulf of Mexico. Another time I had to get precision radar to track it and there's a good, good radar station at Corpus Christi I use it to train Navy pilots. And so I asked the guy that runs it, who's an admiral, if we could use his radar. And he said, my, my lawyer tells me that there are fishing trawlers from Cuba that we know are really intelligence trawlers and they're down there and what happens if you hit one? And I thought about it and I said, well, Admiral, you know, we haven't had time to fit this little bird with terminal guidance and a warhead, but we'll sure as hell try to hit that trawler. And we got the radar feed. Okay, so this is what, if anybody wants more war stories, uh, my card's available, we're doing business in, with asteroid mining. So this is Robert Heinlein. Everybody here knows who Robert Heinlein is because I asked that question last time. Does everybody like Robert Heinlein? Do they think he's a bad guy? If you like Robert Heinlein. Okay, okay, okay. Everybody else can leave. The, uh, Robert Heinlein is a visionary. He, he also was really strange. He wrote children's books in the 1950s while he and his wife were practicing nudists. And boy, did they keep that secret. And he was an enthusiastic amateur photographer. And did I mention that he and his wife were practicing nudists? Did I mention that we digitized the entire Heinlein archive, including all of his pictorial scrapbooks? They're all online, they're all available, small fee. Okay, but we really did on his 100th birthday, we took everything in the special collections department for his whole life and we put it online. And for those of you who like Heinlein books, it's called Dora, which is an inside joke. Digital online research archive. Okay. Mr. Heinlein's wife wanted to remember him because they had no kids, because he had tuberculosis and he was sterile. And she didn't tell him that during his lifetime, by the way, so they tried real hard, but no kids. And now we're all Heinlein's children, and he left his money and his estate and his copyrights in trust to fund the Heinlein Prize. Now the real purpose of the Heinlein Prize is to recognize accomplishments in commercial space activities. That's a code phrase, let me translate it for you. Move human civilization into space in a big way for profit, preferably under ordered liberty. Okay, and the way we're gonna do this, we can do three things, only three things, make enough money to do this. One is solar power satellites, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, we have to do it, someday we'll get our power from the sun, it'll come down in the form of laser and microwave from orbit. Two, space mineral resources. Everything on Earth, everything you've ever seen, is available millions of times more in space than it is here. We just have to go get it. We know where it is. There are no problems with uh, 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 prior settlers as there were in the last time we discovered a new continent. But I'm sure we will create enough trouble as we go up there and find financial gain. There always is. The third thing is position, and that means selling real estate and positions to look at the earth and communicate and stuff like that. But mainly real estate, which we can't sell now under international law. Guess what, that international law is gonna change. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today for about five minutes about the trust, and then for the rest of the time, which is, I don't know how long I've got, but a few minutes, about a study that I'm running for the International Academy of Astronautics. See this blue button here? This means I'm an academician of the International Academy of Astronautics. I call them the Blue Button Club, and they're the top science people from all over the world. I got in because I had some 
friends that were Chinese, Ukrainian, and Russian. I'm sure otherwise they'd not let the American in. They don't do it very often except for good technical people. But I'm, I'm in, so they can't throw me out now, I hope. And we're doing a study that's an international study on the technical, legal, economic, and policy aspects of space mineral resources with a viewpoint that's brought from the whole planet, not just from the United States or Europe or Japan or any of those rich people, okay? And, and let me tell you that every time I, t I give this talk, I say, Americans are population. We consume 25% of the world's materials. That means that if everybody lives like us, she whiz, it's not more than 12% can live that way unless we go get more resources somewhere else. The rest of this talk is gonna be about that. First slide, please. Okay, we give the Heinlein Prize, we've given it twice. This is what we've given it for and to whom. You know who they are. Next slide. Okay, we also do other good things, like we take spacesuits to kids in Britain, India. We, we give Heinlein books to American heroes that defend the United States and freedom, and we've given away thousands of them, uh, and we've shown thousands of students. Next slide, those spacesuits. Uh, Charlie Bolden, NASA loaned us his spacesuit and we're showing it right now at the Challenger Center in Phoenix, Arizona. We're gonna rotate it to other Challenger Centers. Next slide. And we partnered with the Chinese Society of Astronautics. They've been our business partner for 10 years. We are international. And we took Buzz Aldrin over there to meet the top 100 students in Beijing so that they would have met a member of the first crew from the moon, shaken his hand, looked him in the eye, talked with him. And we also had some damn good parties. I'm uh, of the theory that if life doesn't have a good party, you shouldn't be living it. Next slide. Okay, we are publishing two books on technologies we believe are absolutely critical, space solar power and space elevators. We can build space solar power right now, space elevators, 10 years. Buy the books. They're cheap. We kept the electronic price cheaper than our romance novel. Next slide. We are doing the study on space mineral resources with the IAA, and who knows, someday we may get to mine these things. Next slide. Okay, now, this is Heinlein's basic philosophy. It's the way we work. You pay attention to the facts, and you ignore everything else. You look at the facts, 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 and if people have other opinions, and they're not the facts, and they don't have decimal points in them, they're not as important as the facts. Next slide. Okay, now this, I like this slide. Can everybody see the tiny little dot in the upper left near the ring? Can everybody see that? That tiny dot to the left-hand side. I'll show you what that dot is. This is taken from Saturn by the Cassini. It's a photograph, not a painting. It's a photograph of Saturn in eclipse, and that little dot is, next slide, it's everybody you've ever known, everybody you will ever know, maybe, unless we get lucky, and it's everybody you love, and it's all the hopes and fears and all the dreams, and if we don't get off this rock, all we're gonna have is that tiny little dot, and that's not acceptable. Next slide. Okay, this is the basic statement of the problem. It's, it, by the way, there's some mathematics coming up, so you can go to sleep when it gets there. You notice the more developed countries between 1950 and 2050, pretty much level. The lesser developed countries, whoo! Okay, that's the problem. That's a statement of the problem. That's a statement of the problem. If I actually dock this thing off the uh, I apologize. Can everybody hear me? I will become less excited. Okay, okay, if there's anybody that thinks that this isn't a statement of the problem, I don't know what to do. Next. Okay, this is everybody's money in the whole world. And it's a certain number of trillions of dollars. You can read the numbers if you want to. It comes out to about $10,000 a year per person if it was evenly distributed. Guess what? It's not evenly distributed. Next slide. Here is the largest economies of the world as of 2012, okay? 
And you'll notice that we're ahead, but China's gaining fast, and at the pole position is Japan, which is going to go down, and Europe is kind of in there. If you count it as one nation, it's about up with the U.S. Next. Now, I said it wasn't distributed evenly. This is the problem. The top 3 billion people, that's the top 40%, have 94% of the world's wealth, which leaves the 4 billion and the bottom 60% having 6% of the world's wealth. This is a statement of the problem caused by the problem. And I could subtitle this, hand me the Kalashnikov, I need to go kill somebody that's rich. Okay, next slide. If we live like the United States, we have to have four more planets worth of resources. This slide is self-explanatory. Okay, fortunately, we know where to get them. Next slide. We get them from asteroids or from the moon or from someplace other than here. And you'll notice that between 1995 and 2013, the number of asteroids we know about has increased very significantly. And there are major efforts underway to identify even more. Next slide. We know what they look like. We've sent out probes and photographed them. They're flying mountains, or as I like to call them, flying ore deposits. Next slide. We know where there are lots of them. For example, there's a nickel iron one called Cleopatra 216 that's the size of the state of New Jersey. And it has two moons that are about a mile and a half to two miles across that have more metal in them than human civilization has used since we learned how to work metal. And that's just the little teensy weensy moons of this thing the size of New Jersey. Next slide. And guess what? It's not just one or two asteroids. We have lots of them. We know where they are. We have the technology to go and get and use them, refine them in space. If this, you know, it's raining soup. Somebody go get a bucket. Next slide. Okay, now, one of the things that we came up with in this study is how much these things are worth. And this is what, you know, kind of what asteroids are made out of. Uh, don't worry about reading it. You can read it later. This is available online. Next slide. Uh, if you take that little two kilometer in diameter asteroid made out of metal, and you look at what the platinum, nickel, and cobalt, and iron is worth in it, in 2012 dollars, you'll notice that just the nickel is worth about three times the total national debt of the United States. And the total national debt of the United States is so gigantic that I can't begin to explain it to anybody. But if we go and get this one asteroid, we got three times that much money. Next slide. Okay, what are we spending on space? We're spending on space about $300 billion a year, whole planet, everybody, all in, all finished, hammer down. This is about one half of 1% of the total GDP of the Earth. One half of 1%, which pretty much reflects what we spend of the federal budget on the U.S. civil space program, NASA. It's about one half of each penny of each tax dollar. We need to go up by a factor of 10 to get all the wealth that humanity could ever use forever. Next slide. This is how much money NASA has spent on all of its programs. And I, took the, I made this up for the Chinese space program. I took it over and explained it to them and said, give this to your government. This is what you have to beat. It's all of the COTS and CCDEV. It's about $5 billion. It isn't all spent yet. And what have we gotten for this? Well, we've got two new launch vehicles, brand new, Antares and Falcon 9. And we've got two new space capsules. And this is about $5 billion, which is NASA's budget's about $17 billion. So it's about one-third of one year of NASA's budget, spent over 10 years. So it's about 3% of NASA's budget. Next slide. Now, some rich people have seen that this is an opportunity. You know, there are self-made millionaires like Bezos, Bren, Page, Allen, Schmidt, Branson, Musk, and they're all trying to build space programs. There's gotta, these are not the dullest knives in the drawer, folks. There's a reason that all of these self-made billionaires are trying to build space programs, and they're not selling shares on the New York Stock Exchange. They don't have to. They have more money than NASA. Paul Allen, particularly, I mean, he's got this wonderful thing that he's not talking about. Bezos, Blue Origins, very quiet, just read that he spent 500 million of his own dollars 
on his space program. Next slide. Okay, some people are starting businesses, planetary resources, Eric Anderson, uh, the Google boys, the guy that made the blue aliens in the movie. Next slide. He says, trillion dollar economy. This is one of their slides. Trillion dollar economy in space, a gold rush. Meanwhile, they're trying to build small telescopes. Next slide. Then there's deep space industries. You know that guy, he started this organization, Rick Tomlinson. Lots of smart people, not too much money. Next slide. Big dreams, move big asteroids, and, and very bright people. Okay, next one is my little company, which has about two people in it, but one of them's a patent attorney who's patenting things that everybody else is gonna need. Next slide. Next slide. And we think that we can do a lunar cycler if anybody gives us money, they probably won't. As I said, we have no employees, we do everything by contract. But if you wanna read our roadmap by the International Academy of Astronautic Study, it's in there. Next slide. Okay, now history, five minutes. Once upon a time, there was a country called China and they had a space program, pardon me, a exploration program. And in 1421, they put a very large amount of government money into exploring the world and they did seven voyages, magnificent, magnificent. It did not make a profit. It was forgotten about for centuries. They had to fight the Manchus. The emperor said, I need this money for military. Tie the ships up, don't do it. Same thing that happened to the Apollo program with the Vietnam War. Next slide. Okay, then there was this crazy Italian and he raised 50% of the money privately to go and get spices from the Spice Islands, but he didn't have any ships. So he went to Portugal and asked for ships, but the Portuguese king had a board of navigation that was really smart and they knew he couldn't get to Asia. And he knew, they knew the ships would sink and you know, it would, they'd all be dead long before they got to Asia because he knew how big the world was. And so what he did is he went to a country where the king didn't have a board of navigation and didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. And next slide. There's the Chinese between 50 and 300 ships, 28,000 uh, employees on those ships, sailors, and failed completely. No profit. Columbus, three ships, 90 people. He never knew where he went. He never knew when he, go he always thought he'd been to Asia. He went back to Spain in chains and the king never gave him anything he promised him. But he did raise 50% of the money himself. And then Magellan, now I like Magellan because Magellan set out with five ships about 20 or 30 years later with 265 people on board. Same thing, go to the Spice Islands, get spices, bring them back, sell them, make a profit. Next slide. Well, this is the legal contract translated from medieval Spanish into English between the King of Spain and Columbus. It's a contract. It says the King gets 90%, Columbus gets 10%. That's the deal. Columbus was a 10 percenter, he got 10 percent. Remember, the king never paid, it was in litigation for generations. Now, so Columbus never got anything, except he got shipped back to Spain in chains. Next slide, what is it that the king of Spain got? Well, he not only got the New World, but the Pope, the equivalent at that time of the United Nations, this is translated out of the Latin, gave the New World to Spain. Now shortly after that, Portugal raised hell. And so they set up a line of demarcation in the Treaty of the Tortugas or something like that, splitting the world between Spain and Portugal. Guess who they left out? England. And England didn't have a navy, it didn't have an army. It l issued letters of mark and reprisal, started sinking ships. And by golly, we, all sp we speak English here now, even though a little south of us, they speak Portuguese and Spanish. Okay, but the king got everything Columbus got nothing. This is the way NASA used to do contracting. <laughs> okay, but NASA has learned better. NASA has learned better, and now they're trying to do good. Next slide. Here is the deal with the King of Spain with Magellan. The King of Spain got 95%, Magellan got 5%. And that's really the deal that they normally got. It's just the king of Spain never expected to see Columbus again, so he gave him a sweet deal. Okay, 
18 people got back within one ship, but the cargo in that one ship made a profit for the whole voyage, and gosh, here's a voyage of exploration generally considered to be one of the most famous and most successful in history, and they lost 80% of their ships and 95% of their people. Now, if I went to NASA Office of Exploration and said, I have a great deal on an asteroid, we can make boodles of money, and you've got to commission five ships and put 200 astronauts on them, and I'll get you one ship back with 18 astronauts, they'll be sick and dying and the ship will be leaking, but it'll make money. Do you think I'd get very far? Yeah, about as far as the guy from McDonald's got when he went to the Office of Commercialization and said, we'll give you $100 million if we'll brand the International Space Station kitchen with the golden arches. They threw him out. Next slide. Okay, bringing it up to date. Forget about what happened in 1400. We weren't alive then. Now we're at 1900. This is the foremost aeronautical expert in the whole world, Samuel Langley. Langley Center's named after him. Next slide. He was going to build this thing. Next slide. Every time he tried, it did this. Next slide. And ended up like that. Because he had not made a critical invention called warping the wing, which is how you control one of these airplanes. A critical invention. This guy had the biggest grant for scientific research that had ever been issued by the U.S. War Department. Plus, he had the backing of all the East Coast universities and the Smithsonian. He failed miserably. No profit, nothing. Next slide. Meanwhile, somewhere in a bicycle shop, somewhere in rural America, people with no education, but a lot of smarts about bicycles. Next slide. Here's the bicycle shop. Not exactly a powerhouse of industry. Next slide. With their profit, or a small part of it that they didn't use to feed their family, on their vacation, in their spare time, do it yourself, built this. And guess what? the beginning of the modern age. But they had learned how to warp the wing. They had made the critical invention. That's why I think my little Excalibur Exploration Company, because I'm a patent attorney and can file patents without having to pay anything except filing fees, may have a chance. Next slide. Okay, having given you the lesson of history and the fun about how much money is involved, these are the conclusions I draw. It is too expensive to get into space. If Elon reduces the price by 99%, it will still be too expensive to get into space. We have to make it like commercial air travel today. Okay, next slide. We are too risk averse, period, full stop. Risk is a cost-benefit ratio. If the benefit is big, we can endure an incredible amount of risk. And we do in mining all the time. When you say asteroid mining, please stress the word mining, not the word asteroid. Asteroid is just an interesting place where you mine. There is no benefit to NASA. Therefore, the ratio for risk to benefit is skewed. If there is huge benefit, you can take risks. Remember, the XPRIZE aircraft launched the second time after it went into the most god-awful flat spin on the way up. Okay, next slide. Use what works. Okay, thank you. We don't have to invent a whole lot of new stuff. Use what works. Innovate later after you make a profit. Innovation could, should come from profit. Next slide. Respect experts. Learn from them, but remember that they're very often wrong. Example, Decca Records turned down the Beatles because guitar groups were out. Intel and Digital Equipment Corporation turned down Steve Jobs, even though he offered to work for free and split the profit. How about that? And I could go on and on. I've got a whole laundry list of those. Keep going. Okay, who would invest with these people? Now, remember, I normally give this talk to people that don't know, aren't from Silicon Valley. And I, you know, I give it to like a Rotary Club. And nobody will invest with these hippies. And then I say, well, what if I told you that guy in the lower left that really, really looks geeky? Yeah, everybody know who he is? Yeah, everybody here knows who he is. You're from Silicon Valley. And Paul Allen is up there with the big beard. Okay, this is Microsoft. Next. Go get him. It's your job. Now, the International Academy of Astronautics has the study in draft. It's about 300 pages. Anybody in this room that wants to can take and contact uh, me, 
Uh, I'm on the web, Art Doodle, just type Art Doodle, you get my law firm. And the secretariat of this study will send you a draft copy for you to read and criticize. We want everybody's critique. Probably they will throw me out for doing that because it's supposed to be kept secret, I think, until it's finally approved by the commission. But I'm talking to a group of experts in the field of space science, technology, and entrepreneurship, and I need input from you about this study. Now, you're going to be amazed what's in this study. Space mining is going to happen much sooner than anybody expects. ATK's rockets are going to be the ones that take us up there because they're big solids. And we're... Does anybody think that these treaties that were put together as paranoia from the Cold War, as a Faustian... The treaties that we have now come from the fact that the United States thought that the Soviet Union was going to claim the moon, and the Soviet Union thought that the United States was going to put capitalism into space. Well, guess what? Right now, Russia wants to put capitalism into space, and I'm not sure what the United States wants. But the point is that it's like the Pope giving the New World to Spain. And it's not enough just to include Portugal later by making a line. You have to take and actually fit the law to the circumstances. And the circumstances mean that we're going to go into a time of ebullience between now and 2025. It's going to be like the Apollo program, only it's going to be power satellites, it's going to be space mineral resources, it's going to be private launch vehicles, and they're not all going to come from the United States. So. Please get the draft study, critique it, give me your comments. I, I'm counting on you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Art. Yeah, you want, you want this thing back? To give a talk, he is always available to inspire. Uh, Art has uh, taught space law at the University of Houston now for almost as long as his current students have been alive. Um, in his 30 years in space law, he has been uh, instrumental in the development of space law, which uh, uh, of course didn't exist uh, to the previous generation of lawyers, and he was once again a pioneer of the development of space law. Um, Russia and the Soviet Union. Art has had uh, an interesting career in the Soviet Union and then Russia, one of the true groundbreakers. Uh, Art was one of the first Westerners to uh, obtain access to uh, Soviet space facilities. Um, he was the first American to see a launch at Baikonur Cosmodrome. That was big enough news in the U.S. that it was on the military factory one time that built the SS-18 Satan rocket, which is a, a, a the intercontinental missile that is aimed at, at whoever they aim it at. And, and I, they, they also built the first three space stations, and they built my company's uh, space stations and reusable reentry vehicles. They're really good. NPO Machinist Urania in Ryotov, Moscow. Very secret, reports to the Department of Defense where they're only commercial activity, and they were just embargoed by the Obama administration. But I walked in there one time, and I found old spaceships. So I said, old spaceship, is it any good? They said, we have a bunch of them. I said, can I sell one? They said, sure. I took it to New York. I sold it. It's in the Smithsonian. Nobody had ever seen one before. Guess what? It's reusable up to 15 times. Uh, another time, I walked into this same shop. And I, I think I can make you hear me. If it, it comes on, and it's going to blow out your ears. OK, I'm Buckner Hightower. Um, it's been my pleasure to be uh, Art Dula's friend and partner for 23 years, and this is the first time anyone has ever asked me to introduce him. I'm tempted to conduct a roast, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep it brief, uh, however long that may take. Um, this particular group has already gone on record as to how they feel about Art Dula, having uh, given him uh, your uh, Pioneer of New Space Award three years ago. So Art's not a stranger to, to this crowd, but... After 30 years in the field of space law and commercial space, uh, Art has become familiar to a lot of audiences. Uh, he's always available to AA, literary executor of the Robert Heinlein uh, Trust, and trustee of the Heinlein Prize Trust, which Art discussed uh, in some detail in the previous panel. Renowned commercial space visionary, Art Dula.
have I got, have you got me, can you guys all hear me? Okay, there's, there's more people in this room than it took to start most of the major corporations that are worth like half of the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Index. I hope you all can do that because uh, you're the people I want to talk to. Uh, one time, I'm going to tell a few jokes first because you're always supposed to do that when you get up on stage. And, and besides which, I like telling, they're not really jokes, they're funny stories. I, I went into a Russian front page above the fold in the New York Times. Um, Art uh, has joint ventured with the Russians, uh, in fact, was the founder of the first uh, American-Soviet joint venture in aerospace that uh, received uh, a lot of due attention at the time. Um, Art is a serial uh, entrepreneur. I'll tick them off, uh, and there are many others. Eagle Aerospace, Space Hab, Space Services Inc., the first private launch uh, of a rocket in the U.S., uh, Ad Astra Rocket Company, Excalibur Exploration, which is uh, involved in space mineral resources, uh, today's topic. Um, and to just list a few, Art is a member of the Board of Governors of the National Space Society, Fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, Associate Fellow of the I 